Tomer. I want to start with a personal story of my own. I remember one time I served in the Shimshon undercover counterterrorism unit in Gaza. After I was a team leader, I transferred to the Dudevan undercover unit. I think it was sometime around 1996. It was during a time when there were many terrorist attacks. There was chaos in the territories. We found ourselves in a firefight in the Jerusalem area. And I will never forget the situation. At a certain point, one of my friends, one of the officers, was wounded. He got shot in the ass. He got shot. I mean, I don't need to tell you that in the adrenaline of combat, you don't feel anything. You know, he was in the frenzy. At a certain point, we all realized what had happened and we evacuated him. The image of him on the stretcher with, um, you know, he's, he's like this on the stretcher with his bare ass exposed and he's holding his pistol like this. He's ready to fight. Ready to rack the slide? Exactly. He's already got a bullet in the chamber. He's ready to see what's going on. This image, you know, sadly, a company commander from Golani had been killed in the battle, if I'm not mistaken. But this image... During the events surrounding the Western Wall Tunnels. Yes. It was the end of 1995 or early 96, something like that. So this image is deeply ingrained in my memory. And this brings us to that famous photo of you, which essentially made you the symbol of the Second Lebanon War. And I wonder what went through your mind at that moment that made you decide to do this. I'd also like to go back and further understand what actually took place there. First of all, I'll start as simply as possible in this lounge conversation by telling you what went through my mind at the moment that I did it. I'll say this in a very straightforward fashion. Fuck Nasrallah. I'll be damned if I let him see me being wheeled into intensive care like some hunk of meat. I will not be broken, and I will not be defeated. Perhaps, not perhaps, some Hezbollah fighters managed to hurt me, and I give them the respect of calling them fighters and not terrorists. They managed to hurt me, but they didn't hurt us. You mean from a psychological perspective? Yes, from a psychological perspective, but also in general. I think, rather I know, that our forces were able to contain the Hezbollah stronghold that was in the village of Markaba. But if you ask me what was going through my mind at that moment, it was this. I, Tomer Buwadana, will not let anybody send me to intensive care like some ground meat. I will not be defeated. Period. Exclamation point. It won't happen. This is something very... I mean, not, not every person in such a situation would think and say or would be aware of the psychological effect of such an action. Where did this energy come from? After all, you were severely wounded. I think that being a fighter, a good fighter, is something that you grow into rather than something you are taught to be. It's a quality you adopt as an approach to life. A person's ability to fight and achieve things and to persist despite his internal demons with the challenges along the way to achieving these things, the persistence, the determination, the hard work, the ability to continue despite feeling alone, which is something that you often feel when you're trying to achieve things. Mm -hmm. Even before you undergo the military training to be a fighter, these things already bring you to a place where you are ready to be a fighter. The only thing left is to learn the military doctrines. I've met people in the army and elsewhere who could draw their pistols the best. You've probably met people like this. They could draw faster, more accurately, and more efficiently than others, but they didn't always have it. Yeah, it's related to character. I've also met people who weren't the best at shooting or weren't the strongest or fastest soldiers, but something within them made them the most determined. It made them help others the most. It made them the first ones to advance behind cover. It made them sacrifice themselves for the sake of their friends. To pull up, to get them out, to give to them. Sometimes these people were the most unrefined as far as soldiering goes, but they had it. Yeah, and this event proved that the people who were with you in this battle, this quality becomes really apparent. Some time ago, I happened to meet a Dr. Israel, Israel Weiss. Weiss. Yeah, and when I saw the film, I understood that he was the one who inserted the needle. Him and Nir Kleinman, two doctors from the Reconnaissance Battalion. The mission had been a small-scale brigade operation in the village of Markaba, very close to the security fence. I recall that during the happy times of the Lebanon War, soldiers would pass Markaba in convoys returning to Israel, and they would already remove their helmets and clap their hands because they were almost home. So it was close to home, as they say. 
This whole event took place no more than three kilometers away from the security fence. Wow, okay, so, so what actually happened? You were sent to clear a path, right? Look, there's what we knew at the moment in time, and then there's what I discovered after the investigations that were later carried out. So which answer do you want? Let's talk about what we knew at the time. At that moment, our mission had been to clear the areas controlling the road that passed through Markaba. This road was meant to be used as an auxiliary route for the division's operations. Okay. In the event that the main route was blocked, we needed to have forces controlling this auxiliary route, which continues out of the Markaba to Saluki. Anyway, these details aren't relevant. The forces assigned to this mission, I belong to a northern paratrooper brigade. We were two battalions, the reconnaissance battalion and the battalion that I led. I'm referring to reserve units. Under our command, we had armored units, engineering units, artillery units for direct support, and at the beginning of the battle, we even had support helicopters. It was August 10th, three days prior to the end of these kinds of battles in the Second Lebanon War. That's it. At this point in Lebanon, during the Second Lebanon War, the IDF understood that this entire region was under threat, and we had to clear everything past the border. That is no more slow action or covert operations, Rather, it was time to fight like these areas were occupied by the enemy. The reconnaissance battalion led the fighting at first. At roughly 10 a.m., the situation was handed over to us. Handing over control from one force to another is complicated. Combat in a war is very different from covert operations. It's much more complex. Mm -hmm. Transferring control from one force to another, transferring control from one battalion to another, is one of the most complex tasks. Yeah. For example, preventing friendly fire. After 10 a.m., my company was leading the battalion in the houses that were over the road from the western side. So you essentially started to clear the houses? Through the houses that controlled the road. Lebanon is a mountainous region, and the roads are surrounded by houses with orchards and fruit trees. We needed to be in control of these houses because they overlooked the road. Right from the start, we noticed from afar a very big house overlooking the road. We couldn't shoot it with a tank because the reconnaissance forces were lying prone all around. And when the tank fires a shell, debris comes out of the barrel. Flesh it like things, since the shell has stabilizers. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't shoot the house. Like I said, we needed to avoid friendly fire. We started advancing very, very slowly, moving through the houses instead of on the road, since the road might have had IEDs or traps. We moved through the orchards. It was Lebanese agricultural architecture. The houses were meant to house nuclear families. You're familiar with this from the West Bank and Gaza. Yeah. There were olive trees and peach trees. There were also tobacco fields, which are gross, because it sticks to your body in the summer. The inhabitants weren't there, right? Correct. When you got there, you saw a lot of closed shops and those tin shutters, some of which had been ripped to pieces by shrapnel. Any cars that were there had flat tires or were covered in dust from the shelling that had taken place previously. We started advancing, shooting suspicious-looking areas. It was very, very slow. We would blow holes in the walls in order to advance from house to house. Occasionally, there was enemy artillery fire. They use a very lethal shell. Unfortunately, the IDF's most severely disabled veteran to this day, Yonatan from the Reconnaissance Battalion, was critically wounded by one of those shells in this battle. Sometimes the artillery shells would fall, but we couldn't see them. As we advanced, we would find things that were left behind by militants. Sleeping bags, cans of sardines. The company next to ours found a helmet. So you understood that there were forces in the area? Mm -hmm. We didn't know that 10 days earlier, soldiers from the Golani Brigade had been killed there. Mm. We had been told that nobody had entered Markaba yet. We now know that what became known as the Second Lebanon War had not been properly managed. But that's not for us to deal with. Yeah. You're determined. I'm determined. The commanders are determined. The soldiers are determined. You have a goal and a mission to reach your target. Exactly. We were supposed to get to the outskirts of the old city. Anyway, since 10 a.m., we had moved very slowly and advanced maybe one kilometer. From 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. on August 10th, as the Moroccans say, it was so hot you could die. Wow, wow, that's extremely hot. Right, with the ceramic body armor and all the gear, we got to a house that was surrounded by a concrete wall, and it was one hell of a wall. It wasn't like the other walls where we could use a crowbar to bring the terrace down by prying out the lowest brick. It was made out of solid concrete. It was 2.5 meters tall. Wow. We couldn't get through it. The D-9 bulldozer was behind us, and we couldn't bring it, since it might have gotten hit by a missile. We understood that we had to get past this wall. We had to enter by the street and breach the entry gate. The gates were Lebanese metal gates. We had to use explosives. But 
didn't this make you suspicious? All of a sudden there was this... Um... This is the building that I had seen in the beginning. Mm. It was inside the village to get to the Kaspa. The town had an incline, then it went down a hill, then it went up to the Kaspa. The road passed under the Kaspa, and we had to have control of this house. It was clear to me that if we controlled this house and established positions there, it would effectively neutralize the Kaspa. With the road that passed there at the briefing, I had told the battalion commander that we should get to this point. I told him that we should take control of it while the other company establishes the second positioning, and that we should then neutralize the Kaspa with firepower. If necessary, a platoon would enter the Kaspa, but that's already a different mission. That was the plan. And this house was a four-story house, mm -hmm. while the other houses usually had only two stories or maybe a rooftop. They always had those Lebanese grapevines, those overhanging vines on the roof. So we positioned our forces, we positioned the company, and we saw that the gate was a semicircular metallic gate. We would shoot suspicious looking areas to draw out a response from somebody who might be hiding. Mm. The Hezbollah militants did not respond to this. We observed the house and we launched a Lao rocket at it. There was no response. I gave the order and I started leading. Behind me was the sergeant of the platoon. At this point, I was with the platoon of Neri, one of the platoon commanders. His platoon was the closest. After the preventative fire, I led, followed by Neri. On the corner was a soldier from the Ethiopian community. His name was Itzik Balata. He was holding explosives covered in grease. <laughs> By this point, we had run out of the standard issue explosive charges, and we were sticking the explosives to the door with grease, since we had run out of the adhesive material. We had run out of the standard issue equipment. Yeah, so you improvised. We had known that we were going to run out, so we brought some grease with us, mm. so that we could still stick the explosive charges. My signal man and Neri prepared the rest of the platoon for entry into the house. I entered this alley. There was the concrete wall, and it was really like a corridor. I started to run ahead, and I advanced roughly 20 meters. Then I saw a car, a black 1980s Mercedes, and it was clean. This caught my eye. And then I saw movement in the blinds upstairs. I had enough time to pull the trigger once or twice, and then an inferno of gunfire opened up. Wow. I think I was roughly 15 meters away from the balcony. I was right in the alcove before the doorway, which had a wall with the door recessed into it. An inferno of gunfire opened up from the direction of that balcony. And from the balcony of a house that was ahead of us, they started shooting at us. That's the first time I had been shot at with such rapid RPG fire. No kidding. The missiles were flying. They must have had the launchers at the ready, and they started shooting the RPGs. An RPG hit the opposite wall. It didn't hit us. The entire wall became just filled with bullets. There was nowhere to take cover. So you were actually in a bottleneck. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. In a corridor that was 20 to 25 meters long. I shouted to Neri, go back to the corner. Just as I turned around, I felt, boom, an impact to my back. It threw me to the ground. I realized that a bullet hit me right on the edge of my ceramic body armor. The bullet exited my body at the base of my throat. I was thrown onto the ground. I couldn't see anything. I felt a heat that was like we were being baked into an oven. An RPG exploded right next to us. There was smoke. I couldn't see anything. I don't know if it was because my face had been covered by a squirt of blood or if it was from the impact or if it was because the entire hallway was covered in black soot from the wall in the RPG. Mm -hmm. I managed to raise myself up, and I remember that since I entered the alleyway with my left shoulder, that meant I had to get back out with my right shoulder. I leaned on the wall with my right shoulder, I ran the 20 to 25 meters, and I stumbled and fell in the corner when I got to the end of the alleyway. The soldiers pulled me into safety, and I told them that we were sh being shot at from house number 68. I said, move the tank forward, shoot it with Lao rockets. They started shooting a lot, so I told them, conserve your ammunition. I realized that I had fluid building up in my lungs since I started feeling a choking sensation. The medic ran towards me, and he called to Itzik, whose hands were covered in the grease from the explosives. Itzik held down the pressure point on my wound. As far as I know, Itzik had stopped talking to any of us. Unfortunately, he suffers from very, very severe PTSD. So he held down the pressure point, and the medic arrived, and I whispered orders to my signalman to advance the tank and so forth. He yelled the orders to the unit and communicated on the radio, yet Neri didn't come out of the alleyway. They couldn't find Neri. So at this point you were communicating with them? Yes, it was hard. I had difficulty breathing and I felt that the air, something was happening to me, I don't know. I felt like I had a block of concrete sitting on my chest. As the bullet traveled through me, it hit the side of my lung and the air was starting to get into my lung cavity. 
The air couldn't get out. This is known as pulmonary edema. Neri couldn't make it out of the alleyway, but I only understood this after the war. I gave the soldiers orders to keep them occupied, and I called Sachi, my second in command. They were shooting at us from the houses. We were exchanging gunfire. They saw some place where it was coming from, and they shot into the house. Zachi arrived, and in the meantime, the battalion commander managed to jump, and he recognized Neri in the alleyway. The shockwave from the RPG had thrown him against the wall, and they hadn't seen him when they first looked because he had been up against the wall. The tank got close and fired off some shells, and tank platoon commander Rekanati opened up the hatch of his tank and recognized Neri. Then Idan Buchbut bravely took some soldiers with him and entered the alleyway, using the tank as cover. To this day, we have pictures of that tank. It had taken an RPG to the well-armored section in front and to the turret as well. There were marks. They got Neri out of there and they started treating our wounds while the firefight continued. They had laid me down on my right side. I hadn't seen Neri at this point. They put me on a stretcher and started evacuating me through the holes in the walls. And this whole time there was sniper fire from the house until the anti-tank company fired the, the town missile into the window. Before they neutralized the sniper every time he would shoot at us, they would drop the stretcher and lay down on me. It took roughly an hour until we got to... Wow. And this whole time, the grease-covered Itzik Balata was applying pressure to my artery. We got to the doctors, and they performed the decompression and the procedure. They said they anesthetized me. You feel them laying down with a tube. This was hard plastic tube with a sharp end like a needle. And I could feel the impact as they inserted it between my ribs. I was evacuated back to Israel on the engineer's Puma APC, and the helicopter arrived. We got on the helicopter, and as it took off, mm -hmm. at this point, thank God, they replaced Itzik, the poor guy. For an hour and a half, he was holding down the pressure point. The tissue in his finger must have already started dying, no? No, that didn't end up happening. But you know where a part of him did die? Hmm? Here, sadly, in his soul. To this day, my conscience torments me about this. As much as we've tried with PTSD, there are those who can't let go of what their lives in the army were like. Yeah. And there are those who want nothing to do with the experience that they underwent. Sadly, he chose to disconnect. Yeah. No matter how much we tried to help him with work, housing, there are very good people in Israeli society who would be willing to give him the moon with money, anything, housing. He just chose. You know, I think that in general, this issue of PTSD is something that is spoken about more today. You and I are roughly the same age, if I'm not mistaken, and there are many in the IDF. Mm -hmm. I always say that there's nothing you can do about the fact that, in a way, you know, our entire nation is suffering from PTSD. Mm. And that's intensified when you have a certain type of service in the military. Sometimes civilians don't understand what this means and how complex the issue of PTSD is. And some people, it's very obvious, and I can share examples from my own experience. You know, throughout the years, we have established many organizations, and we're really trying to take care of and help our friends who aren't able to get over their service and to function in civilian life. There are people in whom it is very obvious. You know, I'll give the example of a detachment commander of mine, whom we admired and who was a well-respected fighter and officer. He's 47 years old today, and he can't function. Mm. I very much relate to the point you're making. You know, something that stands out to me is the degree to which you take responsibility of everything and how you view the issue of responsibility and your soldiers. I also related very much to what you said. People need to understand that this took place while you were in the reserves, meaning the people abroad in particular don't understand what it's like to do reserves duty and how we see it and the significance that it has, that people leave their regular lives and go do their duty. It's really obvious how much you embrace the responsibility and don't let it go. This isn't something to be taken for granted. Your personal responsibility to your friends and the soldiers who were with you. Even now, as I hear you talking about Itzik, I sense that you feel, I don't know, I, I don't quite know if it's a failure, but there's something there that bothers you. Look, you're right. It's because Itzik stayed there. 
At the end of the day, he's still there. I don't know what's going on with him. Very many people have tried. At first, he would escape with alcohol. He went down to Eilat and spent time on various beaches. He supposedly got a job working security at a hotel, but we found out that they couldn't continue employing him because he couldn't show up in the morning after an alcohol-filled night. Mm. Besides, working security at a hotel after your army service is nice for six months, maybe a year, but he stayed there. Not in Eilat, in Markaba. Even though he left Markaba, he still remained there. And was there a time when you did manage to be in contact with him? I once tried. I went down to Eilat and met with him. And there were businessmen who were willing to fund an apartment for him in central Israel, as well as fund treatment for his PTSD. They were very good people. They would have paid for an apartment in a good area, and for education, and allowance, and food. Everything. Treatment for PTSD. Signing him up for school. They would have given him the sky. But I think that our presence didn't make him feel good. Interesting. That is our presence. Unfortunately, there was nobody else who could do this. We could have done it, but he ran away from us. You know, that's interesting because, you know, my best friends are my friends from the army. You know, friends from basic training, from advanced training, from Shimshon, and even later in my service from Dudevan. We always, you know, we always feel like meeting up protects us. I don't know if this happens to you, but I sometimes block things out. You know, for example, when, when I talk with the guys and they say, uh, do you remember when such and such happened? And I respond, no. I mean, you, you might as well be speaking Chinese. You know, I don't remember that happening. It appears that we develop some suppression mechanism that helps us each cope in our own way with, you know, with what we experienced. You were physically injured and I, look, I don't think one can make judgments and say who it is that, or to define coping with the psychological injury that scarred. For Itzik, the casualty, the way I see it, out of everyone in Alpha Company, Battalion 9263, Itzik was injured the worst. Mm. Not Neri and not me. That's something very... Um... Just look at me. I wish for many healthy people to be as injured as I am. Physically, I'm healthy. I do sports. I compete in globally ranked CrossFit competitions. Physically, I'm healthy. And from a psychological perspective, I think I know how to cope with everything and how to direct things to a very productive and creative place. I don't think I suffer from PTSD in a way that the trauma controls me. But Itzik, the fact that nobody from the company knows what is going on with him, and even the soldiers who had been close to him, even those who had been with him at the Amin Ordi school, He's Ethiopian, and that's where he studied. They also don't know what's going on with him. So I think at the end of the day, he was the most severely wounded, even if it wasn't injured. He came to help save a life, and it happened to be my life. And he is the one who was wounded more severely. I'm not the one, despite all the hubbub that people made about me and being critically wounded, and the V for victory in all this, and you got shot in the back, and the bullet came through your neck, and look what a medical miracle. But you said you took your injury and are directing it to places of your choosing. You mentioned sports, for example. Like, you know, there's a certain place this is coming from. You've always had an affinity for sports and for challenges and for challenging yourself. I heard about the triathlon you participated in, which I would be very happy to hear about. What motivated you and what were the points that pushed you forward to come and say... You know, it's quite clear that it's something in your personality and your experiences when you were young. For example, me, I was always into sports. I have a background in swimming. And some of my friends from the unit also got into triathlons. <laughs> One day they said, Tzachi, we're going to do the mini triathlon. Was it Segev? No, no Segev is another story. Mm. My friends got into running and stuff, and so I figured I might as well. There was a point in time... a few years ago when I used to perform with uh, Mayumana and I had dreadlocks and a beard. I showed up to this mini triathlon with a mountain bike that had a basket <laughs> since I did not have the right bicycle for this. And to hold my dreadlocks in place, I had one of those yellow swimming caps that old ladies wear. <laughs> I'll show you the picture. I had a yellow cap, a beard, a black shirt and tights. I, okay, I got 14th place in the swim, which is respectable. 
everybody passed me on the bicycles, and on the run, I cut up a little bit. I remember this experience, and I remember that it was difficult. I'm trying to imagine what it was like. You know, I, I hear you talk about it, dealing with constant pain. This isn't something that it, it's beyond the regular physical pain with which we challenge ourselves. That's an interesting point. And only in the past few years have I been able to clarify it with myself. Growing up as a little boy who was abandoned by his mother makes you feel weak and insecure. This is something that made me wear a guise of, I'm strong, I cannot be broken. Many of the masks I wore. When I grew up a little bit past early childhood, this turned into, watch out, I'm strong. So you actually cultivated a kind of character. Mm. As a youth, I had always participated in sports. And this became more significant when the more I was in an environment that had more regular people, or even more goal-oriented people. The more I was in a goal-oriented environment, I would add mask upon mask in order to hide how sensitive I was, how vulnerable I was, and how sad I was because of the experience of being an abandoned child. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, my mother abandoned me. She went away. She left my father, my brother, who was three years older than me, and me. And she just went away. She went to live her life. I'm not going to judge her for what she had undergone. She had experienced some not so simple things in life. And unlike me, she didn't have the privilege of getting therapy. But part of the defensive mechanism that I adopted was escaping into the world of fitness and covering myself up beneath the muscles. It started when I was a youth. I was a weightlifter. I was the national champion. I was on the national weightlifting team. I chose to enlist in the IDF rather than to use my draft exemption as a distinguished athlete. So you were exempt as a distinguished athlete, but you nonetheless decided... I did not use my draft exemption. I'd been a member of Israel's national youth weightlifting team. I'd been a national champion, and I held the national cadet record. So why do you think you chose to do this? Because I always understood that if I want to do something meaningful with my life, and I always had significant role models who were not my parents. I had Dr. Chezi Cohen, who managed the institute I had studied at. Yes, you can see that he was very significant. Mm -hmm. All kinds of people who, as a child, I would say, this is a person who could wake up in the morning and do anything he wants with his life. But in order to do whatever you want with your life, you have to do something meaningful. I had been taught to be very aware. There is pain and sadness when you live with awareness. Self-awareness, you mean. Always self-reflecting. Right. I would always self-reflect. Sure, I was the national youth champion. I enlisted in the IDF on August 4th, 1994. Earlier that year, in May, I'd won a national championship for the last time before enlisting. But I knew that being the national champion in Israel is like being the champion of the neighborhood, the housing complex. I would take it and say, okay, but how likely is it if you want to do something meaningful, why don't I be a significant athlete? Being internationally ranked and representing Israel in world championships and flying to the Olympics. I'm in favor of having people like this represent Israel. But was I going to be one of them? Or would I just be the block champion and have neither meaningful military service nor a meaningful career as an athlete? I looked at the global rankings and I said, no, being an athlete wouldn't be meaningful. Maybe I'd make it to 20th place internationally. That's interesting because up until that point, that same self-awareness had seemingly been a mask. Yet it was self-awareness and the understanding that in sports, you cannot achieve the levels. I've always been self-aware. People ask me how. As a kid who had grown up in boarding schools from age 5 up until age 16, when I was kicked out of the Ben Shemin Youth Village, and in one way or another I started learning at Ironi Dalit High School in Tel Aviv. I never cut a single class at school. <laughs> That's nice. Maybe you can speak to my son. He, <laughs> he, he won't stop cutting class. I didn't skip a single minute. Even in a school culture where in the summer everybody goes to the beach, with surfboards, and they cut class, and they would say to me, we're going to the beach, come with us. Yes, I oftentimes used sports to protect myself, and it was my escape. It kept me occupied. I couldn't live with my father in the same house, so I would leave early for school, and then go to the weightlifting league, and return home at 9 p.m. That's all true. But that's also an area you had success in. Yes, right, I had success there. And there were many reasons, but I was self-aware. Why am I telling you all this? because they would invite me to cut class with them. And it was very clear to me, and I said to them, my father can't pad my way to the top with money. What I don't learn and do now, 
I won't have private tutoring later, before the exam. And that's exactly how I answered them. I never got confused. I said, I don't have money for private tutoring like you. You will do 10 to 20 private math lessons before the exam, but for me, what's here is all I get. I don't even have a shekel to spend on falafel. I was self-aware. The more sensitive aspects, and the fact that under all this muscle was hiding a tiny, delicate bird, that's something I didn't let them see. Mm -hmm. That's something I always kept guarded to avoid getting hurt. I had friends, but I didn't let them get too close. To avoid getting hurt. To avoid getting abandoned again. I was once abandoned by my mother, and I was cautious about that. Athletics kept me going, along with the strength. My inner strength was also manifest in my physical strength. Very often, I would use my physical strength to gauge my inner strength. There was a reciprocal relationship between these things. They fed off of each other. My external strength would be a reflection of my internal strength. So where did actually the, the, the confidence come from to say that you're going to enlist in the IDF and do something meaningful? It was clear to me that there were no shortcuts. And if I wanted to do something meaningful, the path to what I wanted to make of myself was complicated. If it were simple, everybody would be doing it. Mm -hmm. And it was clear to me that this was even more true for me. And I'm telling you this, I'm recalling something. We didn't have cell phones back in the day. <laughs> yeah. And one day somebody called the house phone. I have another name no one knows me by. <laughs> what is it? Asher. So the person said, may I please speak with Asher Boudana? It sounds like a greengrocer's name. I said, this is Tomer speaking. That's the other name I go by. I realized that it must have been from the army, since they're the only ones who have called me Asher Boudana in their paperwork. The person said, I'm calling from the Israel Defense Forces, and we have an offer for you. I said, go on. They said, we see that you don't have a driver's license. I was born in 1975, but I enlisted with people born in 1976. Like I said, I didn't even have a shekel for falafel, so obviously I didn't have a driver's license. They said, we see you don't have a driver's license. We'd like to offer you a C-class license, including a forklift driver's course. This way you'll acquire a trade in the Army. Mm -hmm. I said, what do you mean? I have no disrespect for forklift drivers or truck drivers, but I want to be a combat soldier. I want to be a paratrooper. I want to be an officer. The person on the other side of the line said, listen, you have a 97, which is the best medical profile, so you can be a combat soldier. To be a paratrooper, you'd have to go through selection, but you can never be an officer because you have very low evaluation scores. You're referring to the quality classification. Exactly. I hadn't been in the Boy Scouts and so forth. Right, your situation at home. The situation at home, the fact that I was living with my father, who was also unemployed, in a one-room public housing apartment in southern Tel Aviv, which he didn't even legally own. All these life circumstances. The person said, you aren't going to be an officer. Then they hung up the phone. As far as I was concerned, it was the chief of staff on the phone. My brother had been in the IDF until he got kicked out. He didn't finish his army service. You're a big brother? Yes, I have one brother. He was older than me. My father was an old man, and he had enlisted in the IDF in the 1950s. He wasn't very familiar with the IDF. He's an old-style Moroccan guy. Hmm. In my neighborhood, nobody did anything significant in the army, if they served at all. So as far as I knew, the person who called had been the chief of staff. I put it like this. I could say, don't do me any favors. I'll just go the distinguished athlete route. I could be the block champion. Or I could say, okay, but what I want for myself is something meaningful, and that's hard to achieve. Otherwise, everybody would be achieving it. So this is just another step along the way. They close the door, so I'll come in through the window. If they close the window, I'll come in through the chimney. This relates to what I said at the beginning about what makes somebody a fighter. It's not the guy who's the quickest on the draw. It's the person who fights his inner demons. And at the end of the day, you totally proved this, including after you were wounded. You took all this and channeled it into action and fought. That war must have been... Th this is the real war. I think that, look, I can speak for myself and say what the real war was for me. That was the real war. I wasn't afraid of the Second Lebanon War, and I wasn't afraid to die during that war. I wasn't afraid to run in first. And by the way, that contradicts the doctrine. The doctrines state that in regular infantry combat in an urban environment, the company commander does not personally lead the company in its engagements. But I was willing to pay the tuition to teach my soldiers this lesson. Soldiers who hadn't yet passed trial by fire only know about it from drills and from training. So it's like they're doing you a favor when they drop down and crawl or when they get behind cover. You'll see big guys hiding behind tiny rocks with this weariness. That's until they see the first guy who pays the tuition. Then they all take excellent cover. It was clear to me that the first guy is the one who's going to pay the tuition, so I chose to go first. That's also what I said to my company before we went into the operation in Markaba. 
I didn't say that I, Tomer, am going to go first so that I can pay the tuition, but I explained to them how important it is to take cover, and that everything we had learned thus far in the army was for the purpose of life, and not for the purpose of death. You learn to take cover for the sake of life. You learn to shoot better for the sake of life. At the end of the day, all of these drills... Our job is to cause the enemy to die for his country so that we can live for our country. It isn't good to die for our country. It's good to live for our country. The enemy can be the one who dies for his country. I chose to be first in all these situations because I had a good company and good deputies who I know will lead by example. Every person defines for himself what it is to be a fighter. It's like asking, what is heroism? Heroism is the ability to face down and defeat your own internal demons. I don't think that running in first was one of my demons. I wasn't scared in Markaba. People talk to me about heroism. That's why I say that heroism, for which people get medals, is something relative. I don't see myself as a hero, and I'm light years away from being a hero. Do you know why? Because I wasn't scared. Because I was thinking about other things. There are other things that I'm afraid of. I have other internal demons that I'm afraid to even confront on my own. Dealing with them or failing to deal with them is what will define whether I'm a hero or not. Not whether I was the first one to run into the alleyway in Markaba. And you made the same choice in dealing with your injury. That is also a choice of sorts. A person who faces such a situation can choose to act a certain way or, as you're saying, to confront everything, including the internal demons and the disability you had. I no longer have the disability, but yes. Listen, my choice, my injury doesn't define my life. I'm not living with it, as I said. I saw it as just another challenge along the way. I'm the kind of person, although I'm not a recovering addict, the experiences of my life and my educational outlook have caused me to adopt the world of the 12-step program. What does that mean? The 12 steps are a traditional spiritual approach that's used when working with all sorts of addicts. It was well known among people addicted to alcohol and drugs. According to this outlook, there is first of all a higher power. and We are all powerless. But at the end of the day, this approach causes you to realize that there are things more powerful than you. And that there is powerlessness. There is a higher power. But you have the responsibility to know how to deal with these two things. I'll explain. The approach says that we are all powerless. And that the higher power, which is more powerful than us, gives us challenges along the way. The way we deal with and overcome these challenges is what defines what kind of people we are. And it seems that the greater the challenges that this higher power places before you, then the more meaningful your purpose in life is. And it's up to you to decide how you deal with that challenge. Does this challenge control you, bring you down, and break you? Or is it something that you learn how to live with and overcome? And if that's the way that you choose, then it would appear that you are doing the thing that has meaning in your life. This also would mean that you're able to give this to someone else and to live the 12th step by showing others that the challenge can be defeated and how to do this. As you said, there are challenges that are forced upon you and there are also challenges that you choose on your own. And now you're touching here on the element of education and this isn't a coincidence since you established a boarding school. We established a boarding school. Yes, you establish it together. You, you really choose uh, to focus on the element of education, which in my eyes is of the utmost value, where one can really have an impact and shave lives. Mm. There are two ways to change the world, politics and education. Yeah, and, and you were right in between them. Had you considered to go in the direction of politics, but decided to eventually go towards education? Yes, I had been part of the protest movement against the politicians in light of failures that took place in the Second Lebanon War. There really were many political opportunities and invitations to join. Speaking of self-awareness, at a certain point I asked myself, what value would I be adding as the pet war casualty? So I flashed the V for victory with my fingers as I was laying on a stretcher. But will that be the extent of what I've done for society? Because I did that and left Itzik Balata behind, I can now tell people how to fix their lives or what is right for Israeli society? I told myself, Tomer, go gain flight hours and experience in education and doing things for other people before you tell people what needs to be done in the realm of politics. For what sake would I join and become a politician? As an opportunist who jumps on some politician's bandwagon in order to decorate his assembly so that he can say, I have this guy and that guy. Am I some sort of museum exhibition? The moment a person makes it his goal to start dealing with politics, since at the end of the day, it's, it's a tool that you can really have an impact on. I agree with you that it is wrong to make being a politician a goal and a mission in and of itself. 
that's doing politics for the sake of doing politics. Mm -hmm. That's what I call that. There is that path, joining the student union and joining some party and going to the primaries. Everything is for that sake. It's to say, I will be a politician. It's politics for the sake of politics. And then you meet people who are politicians, but they aren't parliamentarians. Yeah. They have no impact. And then you see the phenomenon. We've been witnessing it recently. Yeah, that's an entire conversation in its own right. Mm -hmm. That really leads me to the issue of morality and values and where does the educational platform belong. And I just heard you speaking about how some of your students have started caring for youths who have what I, I will refer to as certain disabilities. You know, there are different semantics that people use. There's so much to learn from these people, and it reminded me of my personal story. I very much relate with this. Um, as a young boy moving all over the world, I found myself, you know, my father worked for the prime minister's office, and as a result, we lived in many different countries. By the age of 18, we had already lived in five countries. And as a kid, my environment changed every two years. Naturally, this opens you up, and you absorb a lot. We lived in Cairo for two years and in Europe. Now, specifically, this story about what your students are doing brought me back to high school in Belgium. When I was around 15, I found myself, you know, there, there were a number of Israeli families living there. And one of the ways I made money was by babysitting. One of the families I would babysit for had a five-year-old son was paralyzed because he had a lack of oxygen when he was born. He also had some sisters, and I babysat for them for three years. I found myself bonding with this kid a lot. I was 16, and he was five. Now, many times, I would rather spend time with him than go out with my friends. I would babysit him at home, do physical therapy exercises with him with the help of one of his sisters, and I would even go with him to summer camps. Mm. You know, there wasn't the privilege of specialized summer camps. He would go to a regular summer camp, and I would be with him for 21 days straight, including everything, taking him everywhere. This included times when he underwent procedures, when he was all covered in casts. Now, what I gained from this, I, I already felt how much of a great privilege it was that I even had the opportunity to come and help him because it only caused me to grow psychologically. So I very much identify with what you were saying about this. And it's very interesting to hear how you're experiencing this and those youth who are caring for. Regarding what you just said, which is very touching, Martin Buber, a Jewish philosopher said, I am me and you are you, but there is no me without you. The way for people to define and see themselves is through others. If we're all alone, then we're entirely absorbed in ourselves. The way for us to experience who we really are is by interacting with others. In just a second, I'll tell you about us. I recently had an evaluation for a charming young man. He came to us with emotional problems and a criminal record, but he is simply a brilliant young man, brilliant. At this evaluation, he told me, he volunteers with one of the kids at that school. As I've said, our students have been working with kids who are on the autism spectrum. I asked him, gee, what is the reason that you're doing this? He answered, listen, when I'm with him, I can feel who I am. He essentially articulated the philosophy of Buber, as well as Reisman's helper therapy principles. He said it all. He told me when I'm with him, I can feel who I am. There are those who cut themselves in order to feel who they are, in order to feel that they exist. But he feels that he exists in the world as a person who has a meaningful impact on someone else. He lives in his own experience by means of the fact that he can see the other. He feels who he is and finds meaning through the fact that he has a meaningful impact on somebody else. This is through helping somebody else. And this puts him in a different place in society. We work with young men from the ages of 14 to 18. Only boys? Yes. How come? Because at the level of vulnerability that they have when they come to us, men and women have different outlooks. The girls need to be protected, they behave in a different fashion, and it comes from a place of acting in, to put it gently. Yeah. It's a behavior of sexual vulnerability and sexual abandonment. They use sex in order to get attention. The young men, on the other hand, use acting out. Aggression, violence, and objectification of women, among other things. 
It's a process that they need to learn. The young men come to me in the framework of the youth law. Most of them come in this framework, and most of them have committed violent crimes and drug crimes. This includes drug use or selling drugs, and there's always an element of violence. At our boarding school, first of all, we're a home. We're not a large boarding school. In working with this population, there's an advantage to size. And we're a small boarding school of no more than 24 young men. There are many, many things that we do with them. First of all, it's an experiential thing. The boarding school is a difficult place to be in because suddenly there are rules. We get young men who have no internal boundaries and we teach them these boundaries. But that begins with a lot of external boundaries. We have many means of enforcement when they get to go on leave and they don't have cell phones. As a punishment, sometimes we deny them the privilege of going on leave. These things aren't simple. Yeah. But the process that they're undergoing is that slowly they need to start operating from internal motivation rather than external motivation in order to move forward. That's the challenge. When a young man comes to me, he comes with his parole officer, and he says, I'm here because if I'm not here, then I'll be locked up until the legal proceedings are finished. Our mission as a team is to get him to choose to remain in the boarding house. This is hard work. The core of our work begins at working with animals. We have a farm that we work with. It's a rehabilitation farm for animals that have been abused. And the young men who volunteer there sometimes witness euthanasia for the purposes of rescuing the animals. They see absolutely everything. We do not water down reality to match what we want it to look like. They sometimes get attached to an animal and then later play a role in putting down that same animal. For example, it could be a horse that some watermelon seller had starved and the horse might be on the verge of starvation. One of the young men would try to feed him with a tube and if none of the methods work, then the young man will also play a part in euthanizing this horse. This has happened. There are also success stories of animals that are rehabilitated. One day a week, we are at a farm where the young men learn how to take care of horses. They say that taking care of horses is uh, therapeutic by nature. There's an element of reflection. If you're forceful, then the horse will be forceful. It, it can feel you out. And recognize this. Mm -hmm. When I explain this, people sometimes ask why we don't use dogs. It's because dogs are animals that seek to please you. Oftentimes, this follows the same unhealthy pattern of communication that violent teens are used to. He can beat the dog and then pull out a piece of sausage and the dog will come back and beg for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. This doesn't properly serve the young man's pattern of violence. But when a young man is violent with a horse, the horse will respond with violence. When you were a kid, did you have uh, experiences with animals? I, I know that your ability to relate, that is, no man is wiser than one who has experience, and, and you grew up in boarding schools. I grew up in various boarding schools. The most meaningful place I grew up was the B'nai Brit Children's Home, now known as the Jerusalem Hills Children's Home. It's for post-hospitalization. They didn't have animal therapy. Animal therapy serves as a platform for teaching the young men how to build a relationship. Everything we're talking about is for the purpose of being able to build a relationship with others. That was the best place I've ever been in. The people there really loved me, not just because they were supposed to love the kids in the children's home. Its therapeutic power came from the power of the love that was there. At this place, I felt loved. I felt necessary. I felt wanted. This place also gave me meaningful role models, and I internalized this. So you actually, you felt seen and somebody was listening to you. I was seen. I was felt. And I felt that I was loved very much. I think that it doesn't matter what method of therapy. Some go hiking, some go out to sea. We use animals. But nothing will change the fact that at the end of the day, it's the close relationships and the love that adults need to give the children unconditionally. There are kids whose way of communicating with the world is sick, hurtful, and forceful, and it repels other people. Many times we need to stop and ask why the young man is choosing this. How is he benefiting by not showering, for example? By smelling bad and disgusting people around him? Mm -hmm. It isn't a coincidence that he chose this way. Many times your ability to disconnect. You know, in the Jewish Kabbalah, they talk about the ability to live in the secret of Tzimtzum. That's your ability to understand that you're not in the center of everything, but that the child is, to put your ego aside. Putting your ego to the side and realizing that if you fail to do that, then there's no room for the young man, and that way you leave him. Personally, for me, I've, you know, I've also been in many different frameworks, and my son, since I'm divorced, and he's grown up with this from a young age, my conclusion from my personal experience and from seeing this experience is that it doesn't matter what specific framework you're in. What matters is the people. You know, you will always have that person. I can tell you about that person for me in high school, thanks to whom I kept studying. To this day, I'm in contact with him 
he, he was my teacher for physics and mathematics in a completely regular high school. But he was just there for me, and he understood me. He listened to me, and he motivated me. Mm -hmm. To this day, I'm in contact with him. And, and when I look at my son, in, and in whatever frameworks, uh, anthroposophic, democratic, it doesn't matter. Sometimes a certain framework is supposed to have a certain value, but it doesn't always have the people in it who really touch your life. Sometimes it works backwards. The framework in the education plan is just a platform. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It cannot replace the people. Mm -hmm. Young men tell me that they love Dharna, and many times they won't say. Dharna is the name of your boarding school, right? Yes, Dharna. At least in Moroccan Arabic is the word for our home. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between a home and a house. It's a home. They're still embarrassed to say that they love the people at Dharna. After all, they're teenagers. Yeah. Let's not pretend that we're in some la-la land where they would say that. <laughs> but to me, they do say it. They say, wow, Tomer, I love you. And they hug me. Wow, wow. When you hug them, they melt. They say, I love Dharna, but that's, regarding Tomer Boadana, love has a therapeutic effect. That's very easy to say, but it's very difficult to practice. Yes, young man, this society brings a certain level of aggression and suppression and a feeling of disgust and egoism. Look, we came up in combat units. We learned that when somebody is egotistical, he gets hazed at night. Oh, yeah. To take a young man who you know is screwing over his friends and he deliberately does things without cleaning up after himself and he doesn't do things when it's his turn to do them and who acts in protest. And then the group gets mad at the staff member, not at the young man, because they're oftentimes not brave enough to be in conflict with one another. So they take it out on the staff. So it's about not giving up on him. Not to give up on him and not to hate him. And he provokes you. He uses force. Look, every person who works at Dharna has an on switch that brings out his inner demons and takes control of them. It's important to be aware of what these young men are causing you to feel and to know to not. I always tell myself that no matter where I go, the version of myself that was abandoned as a child is still standing nearby. Even here, as I'm speaking to you. You can't see him, and the cameras can't see him. But Tomer, the abandoned child, is sitting somewhere here. How is it that this abandoned child isn't sitting in this chair and running this conversation right now? I am the one running the conversation. Because I am always aware that he is right behind me. Mm -hmm. The young men at Dharna can't see Tomer, the abandoned child. But they know that there are certain buttons that will bring him out if they push him. So I have to be aware of what each young man causes me to feel. I can't ask why he's doing it. Rather, I have to ask why I'm feeling that way in reaction to what he's doing. That's what I'm talking about with living in the secret of Tsim Tsum and understanding that you aren't at the center of the situation. The staff member isn't here to fix himself by means of the young men. Sometimes when I meet... Also, that, that does happen sometimes, right? Every time I interview people to work at the school, the staff jokingly says, did Tomer say the sentence? <laughs> there are certain sentences that I say to people who aren't a good fit. Some people tell me, I was a troubled youth, and I'm coming here to rescue them. I respond, that's what lifeguards at the pool and at the beach are for. Don't come here to rescue them. Hmm. I say this because when somebody tells me this, he's putting himself in the center. Yeah. He thinks that he's here to rescue them, but he's actually here to rescue himself by reliving his experience through these young men. That's the difference between living through somebody else and living with somebody else. Are you visiting this person, or are you being with this person, hosted by him? That's exactly the point. Uh, you mentioned the elements of love and the people. I think that at the end of the day, people who have the privilege of experiencing these things in their lives, despite the hardships and the challenges and the baggage that everyone is carrying, I, I can really see it in you. It's like, it's like you're swimming in a way, you know? Everything that you have experienced has led you to doing this, including the way you channel your experiences in the army and during that operation in Lebanon. Now, at the end of the day, you saw that the people who were with you and the friendships that formed and the mutual relationships and the sharing of responsibility, this is where it connects to this project that we're playing a role in right now. It's the story of two young guys mm -hmm who decided to look beyond themselves and their own comfort zone. I don't know what they have experienced that brought them to this point, but they made a certain decision. I very much identify with them because I was also a lone soldier. So I completely understand the implications, the actions, and the challenges that they're facing. 
these are just two guys who decided to come and improve life in Israel and Israeli society. For those who don't know, a much more difficult challenge comes after your army service and how to deal with that. But these young men have decided to take an action and to take the initiative to make this happen. So this brings me to ask you, what is a hero? You know, you touched on that and it's very inspiring. There are heroes who did something in the field of battle and who were injured, and there are those who did other things. But at the end of the day, heroism is about doing and it is about being aware of others. And it is about seeing where it is that you can give for the sake of everybody else. So I would love to hear your thoughts on that and how you feel regarding this project. They turned to me with one phone call and I said it was an amazing idea. I was in. It didn't take any convincing or pressure. When people leave the bleachers and enter the field, they're already in a different world. The way to make a change is through the field, not through the bleachers. I think that this project, which is going to display many different aspects of Israeliness. Different from what? From, I mean, from what people are used to seeing? Right. We are in a period of time in which, in the Western world, people want to understand things through Twitter, in one sentence. People don't have time. They're in a rush. Yeah, there's, there's no depth. People are in a rush. People think that if it isn't in one sentence, it must not exist. I refuse to live in that shallowness of a world that is described in individual sentences. We live in a very complex reality. We fight in a complex reality. That shallowness is not compatible with the reality in Israel and the Middle East. By the way, it isn't compatible with any reality. It makes things shallow. It flattens things. When these two guys are coming in order to say, look, it's much more complex than you think. And then these two guys are coming in order to say, look, it's much more complex than you think. There are amazing people here mm -hmm. who I think are fighting and coping with many challenges. And they live in a very complex world. People are juggling several different worlds. These people could even be combat soldiers who play a role in issues that are contested in the West. But these people have more sides to them. We have emotions. We have insights. We have things we love. And we have desires to have an impact in a broad variety of ways. This comes from, I'll give an example from my own framework. I always welcome young men who aren't even Jewish. There's always an assumption. Today, such a young man had an advancement ceremony. A young man from... A Muslim. Yes, an Arab. Yeah. You can say it. It's been turned into... Of course, he's very loved. The guys love him. As a matter of fact, in troubled populations, kids often turn to extremism and radicalism. We have one guy who was one of the hilltop youth extremists and a member of the La Hava anti-assimilation organization. Mm -hmm. And today he's friends with the Arab kid. Wow. He's his friend and he loves him. Amazing. That's the complexity of life in Israel. If nobody was doing this podcast, I wouldn't be able to say that N who was a member of Le Hava and who used to commit hate crimes and inhumane ideological and nationalistic crimes, such as assaulting Arabs in Jerusalem, he met A and they've become friends. Wow. And today at his advancement ceremony, he hugged him and congratulated him. Wow. That's what it's like in Israel. And that's what we need to show to the public abroad. We need to say, yes, reality here is complex. We didn't choose all of it. Some of it was forced upon us. But we don't have horns or fangs, nor do we have a tail. And by the way, the other side doesn't have these things either. The fact that some leaders act a certain way doesn't mean that the people here are like that. There are people from both sides who are motivated by compassion, love, and a desire to live together. Wow, Tomer. <laughs> I have to tell you that I really, 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 truly, with all my heart, draw energy from uh, situations like that. This is the first time we're actually speaking and, you know, the first time we've met. And I'm a uh, identifying 200% with every single thing that you're saying. It is always inspiring to see people who don't just talk, but who really take action. This whole thing surrounding the existence of gaps in any given situation, you know, gaps between people, gaps between couples at home and between siblings. Mm -hmm. And by the way, we also sometimes struggle to live with ourselves and there is a gap between our desires and our abilities. Every time that I encounter, I mean, every time I, I experience this as well, and in the life I've chosen in my outlook, particularly during the time we're living in, which we cannot ignore, you know, this period of time in the world and specifically in our country, at a certain point, it brings certain emotions to the surface. And I can say that for me, 
It is bringing to the surface a desire to strengthen solidarity as well as morality and purity of heart and truth and seeing and accepting others and the desire to come and see the complexity. In addition to that, we need to understand that in Israelness and in the people here, we have everything we need to make a healthy society that can maintain a dialogue between people who disagree with one another, but in a respectful fashion. Right. The ability to come see those who don't have these privileges at home or elsewhere, like in your story, your reality was complex and it challenged you and you had to draw energy from yourself as well as from the people you met along the way. Listen, we could keep speaking for hours, though I'm sure we will meet again in the future since there are various... I really want to personally thank you for all the openness. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. And uh, may we all have uh, good and better days, and may we continue to do positive things. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, my brother.